All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual learning course, Current Trends That Are Shaping the Data Center Industry. My name is Brittany Harlow, and I will be moderating today's session. The session will be provided via both audio and web conference. The program will last approximately 60 minutes, including a Q&A session at the end. If you have a question at any point during today's presentation, you may submit it via the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We have a couple great speakers for you today, including Joe Hines, Mac McKenzie, and Clay Cundiff from Timmins Group. Also, please note that we will be sending all attendees certificates of completion via email for AIA, EDH, and APA credit. Today, we will be covering how the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing many people to work from home, and as businesses are going online, internet usage and data center activity are at an all-time high. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, the data center industry already had an exponential growth curve with no end in sight, from transatlantic fiber optic cable landings and data center site searches to working on some of the largest and most highly secure data centers in the world. Timmins Group has been involved in all aspects of site selection and data center construction and can help you better understand what you can do to capitalize on this market. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Joe Hines. Joe, please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Brittany, for that introduction. And thank you everybody who has joined us today for your time. Um, as we know, Zoom has probably taken over everybody's lives. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, carving out a little bit of time to spend some time with us to, to uh, go over current trends shaping the data center industry. And then a few site selection insights um, as far as that's concerned. Next slide, Mac. So uh, today we're going to cover uh, a, a number of different items. Um, as Brittany alluded to, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with COVID-19. We'll give you an introduction to our Timmons Group team and our site selection team. Kind of talk about the data center market overview and drivers, um, the COVID-19 impacts, uh, items that make a data center successful. We'll talk about a case study of a property that was just, uh, uh, just purchased by a locality for data center use. And then we'll wrap up and uh, have some questions. We hope that this will be an informative session for you. And um, it's going to be really a good high level overview of the industry. And um, we'll talk a little bit about our analytical data driven site selection process as well. So a little bit about Timmins Group for those of you who aren't familiar with who we are. Uh, we are a uh, national full service engineering design and technology firm. Uh, we have 16 offices located throughout the U.S. We currently employ over 700 professionals, and we've been consistently an ENR top 500 firm for over 28 years. Uh, last year was the first year in the history of the company where we worked in all 50 states, so we do have a good geographic presence across the uh, United States. So a little bit about our data center site selection team. Uh, you're going to be hearing from myself. Um, I'm currently a principal and director of economic development for Timmins Group. Uh, Mac McKenzie, who is a senior project manager in economic development practice. Uh, Clay Cundiff, who is a senior project engineer and technical lead for our site searches, um, will be your presentation team. But we also represent um, a group of uh, a more seasoned professionals who do this work on a daily basis. Um, we also represent 700 plus people in the firm, but we have Leandra Kalila, who's a project engineer on our staff. Uh, Charlie Askey, who's manager of our power engineering and system planning system, uh, as well as Mike Powell, Matt McCracken, who's a principal in our GIS group, uh, Ali Reynolds, an our GIS analyst, uh, Blake Hall, a principal in our Carolinas office, and then Rick Thomas is a principal with our alternative energy practice. So really, uh, what's driving data center demand? Uh, as Brittany mentioned before, uh, COVID-19, we already had an exponential growth curve, and it was absolutely amazing how much data we're consuming as a uh, society. Uh, your iPhones and your smartphones, uh, every time you store pictures and whatnot, they're stored in a data center. Uh, streaming services such as Hulu, Netflix, or YouTube, uh, social networks, and everybody spent a good bit of time on Facebook and LinkedIn since this COVID-19 began. Or artificial intelligence, uh, that is a major driver in it, um, and virtual reality to go with that. Uh, gaming, Fortnite, Call of Duty, Halo, MCC, uh, an issue with latency, making sure that uh, uh, somebody who is fighting somebody literally halfway across the world can, uh, can be able to respond accordingly with Call of Duty. 
uh, satellite imagery storage. Literally, there are companies that are flying and mapping the Earth every single day, and they have to store all that data. Uh, financial services uh, companies, and then with COVID-19, the healthcare telemedicine industry is really becoming important um, as far as uh, data centers are concerned. So uh, let's look at projected internet usage in North America by 2023, uh, as published by the Cisco annual uh, internet report. So if you look at what's going on in North America, roughly 92% of the population will be using the internet, uh, and that's up from uh, 90% in 2018. We're gonna be an average of 3.3 network devices and connections per person, almost double from 2018. Uh, we're gonna have 13.4 network devices and connections per person, uh, by 2023, and that's up from 8.2 in 2018. Uh, the fixed speed for by 2023 is going to need to be 142 megabits per second. Uh, broadband speed, and that's up from 57 megabits per second in 2018. Uh, Wi-Fi speed, 110 megabits, up from, from 47, so almost triple that. And then the mobile cell speed by 2023 is going to need to be 61 megabits per second, uh, almost up triple um, or three times from 2018. So let's look at it from a uh, total revenue perspective and a little bit of show me the money. The worldwide cloud revenue is estimated to be $266 billion in 2020. And pro they're projecting that to go to at least $350 billion by 2022. Uh, major players like Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and Google are major enterprise data centers that are essentially trying to capitalize on this cloud revenue as we shift from having uh, servers internally to your own uh, companies to going to the cloud. Uh, and by 2024, the U.S. hyperscale data center market is projected to be between 69 and 77 billion. And then from a construction perspective, by 2024, they're anticipating that the worldwide construction market would be about 25.6 billion per year, of which 12 billion would be in the U.S. So roughly 45% uh, 40, of that number will be in the United States. So we mentioned gaming, and let's use an example of Fortnite. Fortnite is a game is a gaming company that has really uh, accelerated itself over the last three years. Uh, they do an annual World Cup prize, and this past year it was a thirty minute uh, thirty million dollar pool uh, for the World Cup prize. But in a very very quick period, from uh, August of 2017 to May of 2020, they have gone from less than a million users to over 350 million users. And to give you a frame of reference, in 2020, the U.S. population was 331 million people. So data usage for downloads. Uh, obviously, gaming is pushing the limits on this. But for those of you who watch movies on uh, Netflix or Hulu, uh, to stream a two-hour mo movie is about a four gigabyte data usage uh, for one two-hour movie. If you look at the downloads that are required for uh, Call of Duty, uh, January, February, and March, and these are the updates and the upgrades, and then Halo MCC in March of 2020, uh, 53 gigabytes, 51 gigabytes, 11.5, and 60 gigabytes. All those combined are the equivalent of streaming 44 movies. So gaming evolution, for those of us who grew up in the 80s and were very excited to see an Atari 2600 uh, the Christmas tree when we woke up on Christmas morning to uh, your kids who need, uh, need, need speed with Xbox in 2020, the computing power that has been required to move Xbox from its initial inception of 2001 to where it is in 2020 is tremendous. And these are the specs for that series. So when you look at how that has increased in terms of total capacity, uh, it has had almost an exponential increase and latest latency and data processing really matter and as Xbox advertises every millisecond matters in this business. <clears throat> so what's going on during the COVID-19 immediate impact? I know Microsoft Teams has gone up to uh, 75 million users within the past month uh, from 13 million users earlier this year. We're really seeing unprecedented surge in internet traffic and peak traffic more than doubled from March of 2019 to March of 2020. And that did not include March Madness when a lot of people were streaming ESPN and other services uh, to see if their teams were gonna make it to the next game. Uh, Zoom and other web collaboration services have skyrocketed. 
Uh, we're obviously on a Zoom meeting today, but maximum daily Zoom meeting participants have gone from 10 million in December of 2019 to over 200 million in March of 2020. And that's a 2000% increase in four months. And I'm sure I'm like many other people who wish we had bought stock in Zoom. Uh, AT&T has seen their v VPN demand increase 700%. Online gaming usage is up 75%. Video on demand is helping to offset loss of a lot of sports. And this increased investment in virtual workforce for healthcare, government, and education has driven the internet usage since COVID-19. So let's look at uh, some of the basics of the data center industry and, and what's important to realize as, as we go about doing site searches and developing data center industry. Uh, telecom fiber is a major, major issue. Uh, Facebook has implemented their middle mile infrastructure uh, program where they're literally uh, building fiber lines to, to connect all their data centers, but they're gonna start selling that to help with uh, rural broadband because they're going through a lot of rural areas uh, across America. Uh, Mid-Atlantic Broadband, one of our clients, uh, they, they serve South Side Virginia, um, and we've done a lot of work with them. They were involved with the cable landing uh, site search coming into Virginia Beach. And then Summit IG is another company which uh, helps lay in the fiber from Northern Virginia uh, down to the rest of the world. Um, Energy Mans is another uh, component to this is really critical. Uh, data centers are helping drive the energy market at this point in time. And a typical data center will use five megawatts to over 100 megawatts. Back about 30, 40 years ago, the old chemical plants like the DuPont plant were the ones that were driving the industry, but now it's data centers largely due to cooling. It was estimated in 2020 that 200 terawatt hours uh, per year are consumed by data centers. And that equates to about two to 3% of the worldwide energy consumption um, at this point in time. And then based upon the um, projections by Andres Andre, uh, he's a Swedish researcher who specializes in for information and communications technology. Uh, we could see that growth curve continue up and data centers consuming as much as 8%, even though they're getting more energy efficient, we're still laying more data centers on the ground. But then the total for the industry of networked production of ICT, consumer devices, and data centers could potentially get as high as 21%. So we talked about the uh, cable landing uh, coming into Virginia Beach. Uh, Project Segura, uh, we were hired by Mid-Atlanta Broadband to do a site search for ultimately ended up being uh, Microsoft and Facebook. Um, and that was done in 2014. And this has literally transformed the digital landscape on the East Coast and connecting uh, Northern Virginia, which is the world's largest data center market with about 70% of the data uh, of internet activity going through Northern Virginia uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, Google just announced they're bringing a cable into that landing station as well. So literally, it's, it's great to see how this has impacted air communications across the United States with the rest of the world. So let's look at the uh, transoceanic fiber routes and how we are connected to the rest of the world. As you can see, uh, there's a lot of routes that have already been laid down on the ground and everybody's trying to increase, uh, increase latency capacity and increased redundancy and the ability to be able to communicate back and forth within a very timely manner. So let's look at the data center markets uh, in the United States and our top 10 data center markets compared to our uh, 2050 mega regions map, uh, which shows where we anticipate the US population will be in 2050. Uh, the number one is Northern Virginia and that's in the Northeast market. Number two is Santa Clara, San Jose and South Bay, and that's in Northern California. Number three is Northern New Jersey in the Northeast market. Number four, uh, Chicago is in the Great Lakes market. Number five, Dallas-Fort Worth is in the Texas Triangle. Number six, New York City is in the Northeast. Number seven, Phoenix is in the Arizona Sun Corridor. Number eight, Seattle is in Cascadia. Number nine, Los Angeles is in Southern California. And number 10, Atlanta is in the Piedmont Atlantic. So when you look at the America's 2050 map relative to the US major fiber long haul routes, it lines pretty well with what we see is on the ground in the United States. So the, we're starting to lay out the infrastructure, the uh, energy infrastructure and the transmission infrastructure, as well as the fiber infrastructure are in place uh, to essentially capitalize on the data center market. So let's start piecing the puzzle together. Um, the Timmons Group, we uh, subscribe to a national database 
of, of energy infrastructure information from electrical transmission lines to natural gas lines, um, as well as the uh, power plants that are on the ground. And the power plants are the dots and they're various sizes based upon capacity of those power plants. But as we start piecing the puzzle together and part of what we do in our site selection process is we start overlaying all these different areas to identify what we consider to be high uh, probability of success areas and how those can serve markets because your ideal position is to be uh, an hour or two from one market and an hour or two from another market uh, with a data center such that you can transmit data back and forth uh, to essentially rooftops and the people using uh, the, the devices. So uh, data centers uh, have a tendency to uh, locate in large localities, but they also have a tendency to locate in small localities too. And for small locality as part of your economic development strategy, that can have a significant impact uh, to a community. And we, we did some research and we have um, identified a number of data centers that have gone to what are considered to be more rural locales uh, within close proximity to urbans and to the urban locales and the eyeballs are trying to serve. But when you look at the investments, they're well over a billion dollars. And while the direct jobs might be in the hundreds, the indirect jobs have a four to six times multiplier and they're sniffing at other supply chain benefits. And I think the interesting thing about this is data centers really don't mind being off the beaten path and tucked away in smaller communities uh, because there's some level of, appreci uh, of being appreciated within those small communities and then they can have highly secure facilities that can serve their uh, major markets. So we'll walk through a couple of examples of, of smaller data centers um, and locales, uh, Microsoft and Boyton, Virginia. Uh, initially, it's 347 acre site, about a million square foot on the ground. $2 billion, 400 jobs. Uh, Apple Data Center in Maiden, North Carolina, $5 billion investment and 400 jobs. Uh, that's about a 424 acre site and about uh, 700 and some odd thousand on the ground, as well as a solar farm nearby for the alternative energy component. Uh, Facebook and Apple Data Centers in Prineville, Oregon. And Prineville was a former timber town up in Oregon that was really uh, facing hard times. And then the data center industry moved in and has literally transformed the town. But $2 billion investment in 350 jobs and a billion investment in 50 jobs, respectively, um, for these facilities. And they're uh, co located right across from one another. Uh, in addition, they're right beside the uh, regional airport. And then uh, Monk's Corner, South Carolina, a Google data center is going in there. And that's outside of Charleston. South Carolina, $1.8 billion investment and 400 jobs created, and they have about a million and a half on the ground. And one thing that's interesting to note is all these data centers have plenty of room for expansion. And as soon as they start laying their uh, facilities on the ground, they seem to be on a continual expansion run after that. So uh, how are they making a difference? Uh, Google Data Center in Pryor, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Mays County, uh, the Art Meets Tech. They're allowing the locals to come in and help uh, help decorate the data center so they can uh, have a strong feel and connection to the uh, uh, company. And then they're establishing themselves as the cool place to work. Uh, the data center picture to the left is in Dublin, Ireland, and you can see balloons along the side of the data center, but they wanna be uh, uh, very vibrant and very engaged in their community and make sure that people wanna be invested in their success. All right, thank you, Joe, for that overview of the data center market. Uh, what we'd like to talk about now is some common data center types as well as data center drivers. Uh, common data center types can be primarily broken down into two distinct groups, enterprise data centers as well as co-location facilities. Your enterprise data centers are your build-to-suit data centers, such as a Facebook, a Google, or an Apple. The sh and then also these enterprise data centers can be uh, built out in shell buildings such as former microchip plants and commercial warehouses. Co-location facilities is broken down between managed wholesale companies as well as managed commercial retail companies. And some examples of these co-location facilities are names such as Digital Realty, QTS, and Cologenics. I think it's important to note here that the lines between enterprise and co-location facilities is, is starting to be blurred a bit as many of the built to suit data centers such as a Microsoft or an Amazon is very likely to rent or lease space in a co-location facility such as Digital Realty to get closer to their end users. 
Next, we'd like to talk about some data center drivers. And while certainly infrastructure is a key component to data center location, it's not the only driver. Access to abundant utilities such as power, fiber, and water is critical for data center success. But it's also important to note favorable tax structure as well as fast track permitting entitlements is important as well. Avoidance of man-made and natural risks are important to data centers as they are generally a risk adverse industry. Low latency and proximity to customers is also very important in some cases. And then of course, property size costs as well as local support as Joe touched on a bit earlier is very important to data centers. That feeling that they are welcome within the community and helping make a difference. The first utility uh, related data center driver that we'll go into more detail about is power. The preferred transmission level line size for data centers is generally between 138 kV and 230 kV transmission lines. Lines that are smaller than this typically have capacity issues and will require additional detailed study. And then lines that are larger than this, up to 500 kV, are generally power plant to power plant lines that are untappable. Another important component related to fiber is three-phase power, which ensures a consistent load for the data center. It also allows for fewer wires and lower voltages than a similar configuration for a single phase setup, while still delivering the same load distribution. And finally, the redundancy ensures uptime. Data centers operate at a five nines level, which is 99.99% or higher. To put this in a different way, this maybe makes a little bit more sense. That equates to a downtime of only 5.26 minutes a year or broken down further on a monthly basis, 26 seconds per month is seen as the acceptable amount of downtime for many data centers. One important metric when measuring the power success of a data center is power usage effectiveness. This is computed by the total power consumed divided by the power consumed by IT load. This is also essentially calculating your power overhead. Much of the power overhead is made up of the power utilized in order to cool the equipment. We would be remiss if we did not at least touch on cost of power as well. As you can see in the table below, just one cent can make a significant difference in the overall cost metal model of a data center. As you can see, as you go up one cent for a 10 megawatt data center on a monthly basis, that's $73,000 difference. If you extrapolate that out on a yearly basis, you can see that you get nearly $900,000 per year for a 10 megawatt data center. As Joe identified earlier, 10 megawatt data center is on the lower end of what we see for typical data centers. You can only imagine extrapolating these numbers out to 50 megawatts and 100 plus megawatt data centers. With such a heavy power reliance and growing pressure to balance energy uh, profile consumption, it only makes sense that data centers would evaluate energy trends. Clay is going to talk a little bit more about alternative energy trends in the data center market. Thanks, Mac. Uh, yeah, so starting looking here, uh, just taking a quick look at what the EPA kind of identifies as various uh, electrical sources. And so most of the, the grid these days is made up of conventional power, um, which is your coal, nuclear, oil, and natural gas. Um, however, what they're striving for uh, is the green power, which is actually just a subset of the renewable energy, um, as you can kind of see in the graphic they've laid out here. But this is what they have seen as the target for alternative energy when, when trying to balance this profile uh, and the goal with data centers and, and with other energy consumers is really getting into the green power of wind and solar um, in those types of power that have very minimal impacts on the environment. So <clears throat> back in 2007, there was uh, an initial push um, to integrate more green energy and, and alternative energy into data center power consumption. However, it, it kind of fell uh, or it came at, a, at an inopportune time and the environment really wasn't prepared for or in the right scenario for it. So since then, there have been a number of shifts and you know what, one of those that's obvious to everyone is a global energy policy shift. There's lots of conversations being had around global warming and other things that have shifted the conversation and the, and the idea of responsibility and social responsibility behind green power. Um, 
The other one is increasing affordability of green energy as the technology has improved uh, and there have been a number of trial and errors. It has become a much more affordable option than it once was. It's also, as that has, I'll step back real quick for me, Mac. It's also become um, more obvious as, they ha as this technology has improved that there is a great value in the consistency of having free wind and free sun. However, as we all know, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow like we want it to. Um, so it's not 24 seven energy, which makes it difficult uh, at times for some data centers. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, there's also been a large perspective shift. As you can see from the table on the right, this table highlights the top 10 telecom users uh, of the US EPA Green Power Partnership. And so kind of highlights just how much kilowatt hours are using Google at the top at 7.5 billion kilowatt hours a year, uh, but they have 106% of their total electrical use as green power. Now, this is not all directly sourced into their system. A lot of this is purchase of certificates and other things, but you can see from the, the kind of who's who list here, this is something that's really important to this industry as a whole and something that people are really, folks like T-Mobile and Digital Realty at only 34 and 11% are really focusing on, on making that change because it's become more attractive from the marketing, from the social responsibility and from a cost standpoint. Just to highlight that a little bit, this kind of shows you the Digital Realty, which is one of the largest providers uh, from co-location as Mac noted earlier, at only 11% of their total power usage being green power, they still have 0.6 billion kilowatt hours a year. That puts them up there above Intel, you know, in the top three, if you were to, if they were to get to 100%, and this is something that they want to do, as you can see from this article that we grabbed a, a snip from, this is something that is a priority in this industry that folks are really looking into balancing this part of their profile. Question kind of then comes up, is it realistic to expect this to happen though? It, and the global, according to the global industries, yes, they think that by 2025, up to 13% of all data center power will come from green, or green and renewable energy. This is a good thing for um, you know, all the reasons that we've previously discussed, but there's also some nuance to it, as previously mentioned, because data centers do need that constant power. So one of the questions that's commonly asked uh, you know, in getting that uh, low downtime that Mac discussed earlier is can renewable energy really supply that demand? And the answer is yes. An example of one of the solutions that helps integrate this is microgrids that uses renewables on within a system uh, that has multiple other uh, facets to it, but allows it for peak, allows for peak shaving and a number of other pieces to push that energy back into the grid um, when it's not needed and consume it when it is. Thanks, Clay. Uh, and so as I mentioned earlier, the, the second utility infrastructure related item that, that drives data centers is, is water or, or cooling these facilities. Uh, cooling makes up the majority of the power consumed outside of IT load. And to put this in a, another way, one ton of cooling infrastructure can cool 3.5 kilowatts of data center or data computed. And so obviously as we extrapolate that over a 10 to 50 to 100 plus megawatt facility, you can see that the significant amount of cooling infrastructure is required in order to cool these facilities. As such, ambient air cooling is considered a major positive for data centers in their location. As you can see on the map on the right, the, the average air temperature that's seen as the sweet spot is between 50 and 75 degrees, which is generally the, the central part of the country and, and the northern parts as well. Obviously, we also need data centers in the southern portion of the country as well, and it becomes a, just another line item that the data centers have to work through. Some data centers in the southeastern United States are even reported of using 4. million gallons a day or more just for cooling. So significant water required to cool some of these facilities in the deep south. When we are evaluating sites for data centers, it's often to see half a million to one million gallons per day requested for a site, even if it's not necessarily planned on being used immediately by the data center. Data centers tend to like to have that comfort level that the abundant water supply is there should they need it for cooling their facility. 
The next major utility infrastructure driver for data centers is fiber. And a couple terms to understand as we talk about fiber is bandwidth and latency. Within a data center, internal cable connections can transfer data at mind numbing speed. The issue becomes when we start to take that data and send it to the outside world. Bandwidth is how much data we can push through those pipes or those fibers. Latency is how long it will take the data to go from point A, point B, round trip, essentially a reaction time. So lower latency, which equates to faster speeds or reaction, and higher bandwidth, which is the same thing as capacity or amount of data, make a location more attractive for a data center location. With this emphasis on low latency and high bandwidth, there's increasingly developed the edge or edge data centers. Edge data centers are smaller facilities located closer to the populations they serve to help reduce that latency and improve customer experience. Some edge data center drivers include the anywhere, anytime access to apps, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and internet of things, as we continue autonomous vehicle research and production uh, that will also drive edge data centers. And then also obviously within the last two months with telemedicine and work from home resources has seen an explosion in the need for edge computing. Additional 5G development will further advance edge data centers. We could probably spend an entire hour talking about 5G development as well as edge data centers but the two will likely go hand in hand as the promises of 5G development are realized. A little bit of background is 5G is not just the next greatest cell phone service. It's enhanced mobile broadband, but also the technology needed for ultra reliable and low latency and massive machine type communications that are needed for autonomous vehicles, smart homes and smart cities. So now that we have the background on what are some data center drivers, how can your locality or your region prepare for prospective data center users? The first step is to evaluate your existing sites, understanding their proximity to abundant fiber, power, and water, and assess the site's readiness for development. As an example, a 400-acre Google data center campus is expected to open within a year from the development being announced. Speed is obviously critical to data center development. The next step, if you determine that you do not have ready or existing sites for data centers, is to perform a site search for potential data center sites. Again, focusing on these key data center infrastructure drivers of power, fiber, and water. And then finally, evaluate locality and state tax rate structure, and even consider introducing a special data center rate especially if you don't have any existing data centers. If you introduce a special data center rate without any existing data centers, you're not really losing any tax base, but you are becoming competitive and getting in the game as far as data center attraction. Next, Clay is gonna talk us through some of the site selection basics on these infrastructure-based studies. Thanks, Mac. So we have a tool that we use uh, at Timmins. It's a proprietary process that we've developed. We call it ADSS, Analy uh, Analytical Data-Driven Site Selection. And as you can kind of see a little bit from this overview graphic that we have here, this is, the process is intended to take all of the elements that are, are essential to uh, the first phases uh, of the site search and to make you smarter, to make, to make anybody that's working on, on the site selection process more, you know, go through the process more intelligently. Um, <clears throat> we break it down into three phase or three levels uh, when we when we talk about it. So next slide please. So level one kind of a, when we're at our base we have the most number of sites we're looking for. This is really and, and this gets at what a lot of what we've talked about so far uh, in the presentation as far as what we're looking for and what we're looking to weed out in this. The pieces that we want to rush to the top, the big nets, the major filters here are electrical transmission and power availability, proximity and availability to water and sewer, as well as fiber access. The, what, what we're shooting for here, the guiding principle at level one is the highest priority items 
that are the most difficult to change, either the most expensive or the most time consuming items. These are the ones that you want to, to know the first, the first level of sites that are going through. These all meet this criteria that, it, that is the most costly or most time intensive um, or most important to you. One, one example with that, as we've talked about transmission, is this, this piece is actually far more complicated than it might seem on the surface level. And it really requires a regional uh, and holistic evaluation. And, and oftentimes it, it's essential to involve a transmission consultant or the, the power company, the representatives with the power company to have the conversations around where power availability might be because the system is very complex and it requires an expert to, um, to work with you to understand where might be you know, not just on a line, but on a line that actually has capacity in it. And that takes us into level two. And as you saw a little from the a graphic a couple of slides ago, this is a lot about um, processing the, the additional constraint information and enriching the data. Uh, the process is called geo enrichment within the GIS system and, and lingo that's often used today. So this takes things like wetlands and streams, buffers and uh, floodplains, topography, um, any potential <clears throat> conservation easements, that those sorts of things. And it gathers all this information on all the parcels that came through on level one. Um, and, it, and it enriches it, it adds this information to uh, the parcels themselves, allowing you to make smarter decisions uh, moving forward because you have all the data that you need at your fingertips um, when you start looking at these sites. And we're gonna step through an example um, to kind of picture that. So here we have a, uh, an area in Southwest or Southern Virginia. And so as we start to step through, this is kind of all the parcels. <clears throat> the next slide is really intended to outline uh, what we always see when, we, when we're when we looking at one of these site searches, which is the large tracts of land are much fewer. However, they take up the majority of the land mass. Um, doesn't always mean that they're developable, but so first step, we're looking at fiber here uh, in this search. And so we did within five miles of the fiber line that we were looking to, or looking along in terms of priority. Kind of the next step, we added in water and sewer. And so taking proximity to uh, good capacity with water and sewer, and then finally adding on the transmission infrastructure. So the goal with this uh, is, is brings us out of level two with some sites to, um, to bring into a level three that we'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> So important thing to realize at, at this point, because there's a transition that happens here. The computer is an invaluable resource uh, and it's irreplaceable during, during this process. It provides an unbiased look at your priorities, helping you crunch data that it would take months or years for a human to crunch um, in their head or, or, or in an Excel spreadsheet that they're recording it in. And it's much more precise and efficient when it comes to uh, you know, tabulating all that information, filtering on that, and, and helping you narrow down the search. However, it's only going to get you about 50% of the way there. It will never take you to your top sites because the computer can't fully comprehend and, and take into account all the different aspects that an experienced eye, an, exper an eye that has, has done development um, in engineering before, those are essential to, to narrowing the field from the top 50 to the top three. Now we're going to pass it back to Mac to talk a little bit about level three, kind of the final stage of this process for us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clay. And, and so as Clay mentioned, you know, the computer can only get us so far. And so at level three is when we start to take everything that the computer and the GIS analysis has produced and marry that up with the local knowledge and the engineering expertise uh, of the area and of, of site development. And so local knowledge is such things as permitting requirements, real estate, property ownership information. The engineering side is understanding on how all these sites con site constraints fits together and under understanding what the largest data center facility we can fit on any given site or any given parcel. So again, leveraging the local knowledge as well as engineering expertise to identify the top site. So one of the ways we do that is to take all the information from GIS as well as the engineering evaluation and put it into a decision matrix such that we can begin comparatively and 
analyzing these sites and start making smart decisions for which sites would make the best data center, which sites have the highest probability of data center success. So some items that are included in this decision matrix are such things as acreage, number of uh, or electrical provider with transmission line size as well as power capacity. And then also understanding, again, data centers are a very risk adverse industry. So we wanna understand those seismic hurricane and floodplain factors as well. Obviously, we'll also want to include water and sewer uh, capacity and general site commentary that will probably tie in some of the ownership information uh, from the local level. Within this decision matrix, we'll also want to include and evaluate the environmental, topographic, and other engineering related constraints on the site. Next, Joe is gonna take us through a case study of a site that was selected from the site selection process and the additional detailed engineering evaluation that went along with it. Uh, thank you both Mac and Clay and um, uh, appreciate that comprehensive overview and hopefully everybody's been able to follow it to, to this point. Um, to give everybody kind of a quick high level uh, summary overview of, of the process, you know, what we've gone through and done is uh, we've done what we consider the areas of high probability of success. Uh, we've identified those intersections of power and utility, utility availability. Uh, we have received the input and done some detailed analysis with the um, power companies and with their transmission team to make sure that we have the capacity on the electrical transmission line since that is the number one priority. Uh, we'll take those final areas for detailed study uh, by Timmons and the power providers and clients. Uh, we've received input from our water and sewer capacities uh, from the localities. We've received input on fiber and telecom. And then we performed a high level uh, site evaluations incorporating all the GIS data that's available that Clay alluded to. Uh, one point I want to uh, mention here is talking about um, the, what, what you can change and what you can't change. And what we've seen with this uh, doing site selection in particular for data centers is you need to be located on or at least one parcel away from an existing transmission line that has a capacity. Ideally, you do have a 138 to 230 kV line, and ideally you maybe have them at an intersection point uh, on a piece of property. And that's part of what you're gonna see in the case study for the Lockwood parcel, uh, which Prince Edward County, Virginia just closed on. Uh, so the power providers and consultants have really assessed the short-term and the long-term uh, power capacities. And that's usually they want to have about 10 megawatts available within 10, uh, nine months while you can construct a data center and then 50 plus megawatts, if not 100 plus megawatts in 12 to 18 months, which is essentially a transformer and a substation type capacity. And then we put together that decision matrix to rank the top sites uh, like uh, Mac alluded to in the previous slide. And that's leveraging your local knowledge and then applying your engineering expertise. So um, we went through the study for a client, uh, Mid-Atlantic Broadband, and we identified uh, several areas, uh, 65 areas in particular, across the 34 locality region that had what we consider to be high probability of success, success areas. Uh, we identified one parcel in particular in Prince Edward County, uh, which just so happened to be um, at the intersection of a 230 kV line and two electrical transmission lines. Uh, it was approximately 280 acres. Uh, it was accessible to water and wastewater, and we had the potential for uh, reuse wastewater because we're only about two and a half miles uh, from the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the site was approximately 65% uh, percent developable acreage, and it was in Dominion Energy uh, Service Territory. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Northern Virginia market, uh, the two predominant power suppliers in Northern Virginia are Northern Virginia Electrical Cooperative and Dominion Energy. So Dominion is very familiar with the data center market and was very excited about this parcel when we identified it as well as Mid-Atlantic Broadband. So then we have to go through the steps of, can we rezone this property or can we readjust the zoning to allow for data centers? Uh, we were fortunate in this particular case because Lockwood parcel was adjacent to C1 zoning. Uh, so it would not be technically spot zoning if the county were to rezone this piece of property. So they're gonna go through the process to adjust the uh, commercial C1 zoning to be accommodating to data centers. And then they're going to go through the process of essentially zoning it uh, to a C1, uh, such that it'd be accommodating. 
And then we do a build out analysis. We had mentioned that earlier, but this is where the rubber meets the road. There are two dimensional and three dimensional aspects to every site, as well as the environmental components that you need to adhere to, as well as infrastructure. Uh, we were fortunate because where these two transmission lines came together, we could uh, install a substation nearby. Uh, we do have natural buffers on the site uh, with, with floodplains and, and woods on one side of the site. And then we have an existing lake uh, down below where we could put out, uh, lay out the data centers that could be used for a regional stormwater basin. And the site is nice and tucked away and very highly secure. But we were able to get 1.3 million square foot of data center capacity on the ground. And then that turns into uh, a return on investment. But to be truly attractive in the market, you need it to be a tier four site in terms of site readiness. So if you're a local government or an economic developer looking at uh, potential acquisition of site, you need to know where the money is coming from. As we mentioned earlier about show me the money, it's the same thing happens at the local level. So one of the things that we're seeing is consistently a, a minimum of $1,200 per square foot investment uh, for data centers. And we have seen it as, as recently go as high as $2,350 per square foot in New Albany, Ohio. But you try to break that down into a reasonable real estate investment and machinery tools and business personal property uh, uh, investment. And then you have to apply depreciation uh, for the machinery tools and business personal property. Um, and then you, you factor in tax rates. And what a lot of localities are doing is they're lowering their uh, machinery and tools and business personal property or uh, applying a data center equipment tax rate to be competitive in the marketplace. So in this particular case, we, had the, we uh, lowered it to the lowest possible one. We went through this process. We had 1.3 million square foot of build out. It equated to about a $1.6 billion investment, of which 520 would be, uh, 20 million would be real estate, about 1 billion would be machinery and tools and business personal property. It would create an annual tax of roughly $4 million. And in local government uh, terms, it really is about bonding capacity and what can you do for capital improvements for both infrastructure and or your schools. That gives you a bonding capacity of potentially $55 million over a 20 year financing at 4% or $70 million over a 30 year financing at 4%. So uh, looking at the site identification process and timeline for Lockwood parcel, uh, we began the site selection study in October of 2018. We went through and down selected to our top 30 sites by February of 2019. We did the detailed evaluation of the top 10 sites starting in March of 2019. We presented our results to the stakeholder group uh, June 19. Uh, we began preliminary due diligence for those top sites in October of 2019. We completed that and submitted the ROI estimates to uh, the client on March 2020. They made a decision to go ahead and purchase the property in March and April 2022. Independent boards made that decision. And then they acquired the property um, by the ADA and they're starting to prep their marketing materials as of this month. So to kind of provide an overall summary, um, the data center market has exponential growth. It already did before COVID-19 and that's only been amplified by COVID-19. Uh, the utilities and location drive the site selection process. And obviously time to market is critical. Um, once data centers go up, their uh, time is money and they need to get the facilities on the ground as quickly as possible. Uh, tier four ready sites are the standard in, uh, in the industry now. Uh, infrastructure and engineering based site searches uh, help find those best sites. And again, we're looking for the highest probability of data center success for, for you and your clients. So now we'd like to open it up to uh, questions from the group. I think we have about 10 minutes and we do have a couple of questions that have been asked online. Um, we'll start off with the first one. Please speak to electrical cooperatives ability to attract data centers. So uh, historically in the industry, uh, data centers um, uh, are really only looking for where the most competitive cost structure is. Um, as I mentioned about Northern Virginia, which is data center alley. Uh, there are two predominant players, it's Northern Virginia Electrical Cooperative and Dominion uh, Energy. And those two players up there have figured out a way they can structure the rate structure. I know that uh, uh, Duke Energy and uh, South Carolina um, Power Team also have competitive rates as well too. So really, they're, they're, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a cooperative or a major power provider. Historically, they've looked to major power providers, but they really want the most competitive rate. Okay. Um, 
The next question is cooling water recycled, recirculated within the facility, or is it discharged to the local uh, sewer and stormwater system? So this is a very important element. Um, when we did a data center site uh, certification program for a client uh, several years ago, one of the things that uh, is, becomes obvious is the water required for cooling um, has to be condensed down um, because it's being evaporated off in the system. And they recirculate that as much as they can, but usually it's about a, a, um, a four to one, three to one, four to one reduction. So if you have 100 gallons go into the cooling process, we'll have between 25 and 30 gallons come back out for the wastewater process. But you cannot discharge, discharge that into the storm waters. Um, what is the reality of a data center located on a small site about 10 acres? Um, that's, that's always a possibility. I know that the uh, sites um, or data centers are historically looking for larger sites, um, but I don't want to say no, that that's not a possibility, but um, I would think the larger the site and the more infrastructure you have at the site, the, the better off you are. But I would certainly say there are enough specialized uh, data center providers out there that I would certainly market that site and try to attract one of them to it. Yeah, Joe, let me jump in there. Um, so as I talked about a little bit, you know, the, the idea of edge computing and edge data centers, as well as the development of, of 5G and everything that will mean, I think there's definitely going to be a market going for, forward for smaller data center sites that are maybe located closer to the population base versus some of these larger enterprise uh, level data centers that we've we spent some time talking about. So I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Uh, if, if not immediately, certainly in the future. Okay, thank you. Um. So there are a couple more questions about the edge centers. Um, Mac, uh, there is one um, that says, what size are the edge centers usually? Uh. Yeah, and that, that's that's hard to to nail down specifically. Um, you know, they, they are much smaller facilities um, that would use power. You know, a lot of what data centers are, are talked about is you know, the power consumption, and those are you know, one megawatt or less facilities. Um, so I, I think certainly uh, sites that are, are 20 acres or less, 10 acres or less, would would be a, a target um, for edge data centers. Okay, um, and then we have a couple more about that. Um, what considerations should an urban or suburban locality consider in recruiting data center or edge or edge data center? It's going to be many of the same things, uh, just on a smaller level uh, of the larger data center. So you're still going to need the the access to transmission level power. You're still going to need the, the access to to water uh, facilities as well as well as fiber. You know, a lot of the, the 5G development is probably five to 10 years down the road till full implementation. And, and that requires a lot of reconfiguration of data center infrastructure as well as cell tower infrastructure. And I think we're going to see a, a higher density of these smaller edge data centers as well as these uh, cell towers in order to, to deliver the promises of, of the 5G uh, network. Okay, um, and then you might have answered this one. Um, we got another question that said, are edge data centers sized differently than other centers or are you referring to them being on the edge of the system? Yes, <laughs> to, to answer the question uh, uh, quickly. Uh, yes, they, they are smaller and they are on the edge of, of, the, of the network, so to speak. Um, you're always gonna have the large enterprise data centers, the, the heart, beat of the, the overall system, if you will, but the, the edge data centers and the drive for the edge data centers is based on, again, getting that low latency, quick response time that's required for the development of autonomous vehicles and, and just overall customer um, interaction with apps and virtual reality and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, so we still have a couple more questions coming in. Um, let's see. Are data centers using less water than they used to today? Uh, yeah, this is Joe. I will answer that question. So um, as Mac alluded to, um, the ideal sweet spot is between uh, 50 and 75 degrees in the United States. So one of the trends that we're seeing is say maybe um, 
15 years ago, the transistors and equipment uh, needed to be um, cooled at 70 degrees. And, and when I was in college, I spent uh, a semester working at IBM and I basically did a, a data, um, not data cooling for motherboards uh, testing. And that was back in the eighties uh, in Research Triangle Park. So the, the processing equipment, obviously with Moore's law is getting faster and quicker and better. And so we're able to cool now up to temperatures as high as um, 80 uh, to 82 degrees. And for example, there is a major data center um, located throughout Southeastern United States that they go to entire air cooling for roughly five months out of the year. And then for the other seven months that they have to work cool um, given, the, um, given the type of air cooling that they have in place and water cooling they have in place and temperatures they can run their servers at. But as, as the servers become um, better and better and better over time, uh, their ability to operate at a higher temperature is, um, ability to hire, operate at a higher temperature is certainly uh, turning down the cooling cost and uh, need for water. Um, also, I see one about related to uh, data centers located in abandoned shopping centers or strip malls. Um, yeah, that, that's certainly a possibility. Um, part of what you need is a very highly secure facility. Um, and a lot, again, a lot of it depends on what the infrastructure is available there. But some of these edge data centers could potentially go in these abandoned uh, shopping centers or strip malls. Um, I don't know if the existing building would um, accommodate, but they would certainly be able to do an evaluation for that. And for example, OVH uh, went into an old government facility and OVH is one of the largest cloud data center providers in Europe. Uh, they were coming over to the United States up in the Northern Virginia area, and they went into an abandoned FBI slash CIA training facility um, just outside of Washington, D.C., and they liked the story of it, but they were able to secure the facility to the level they felt comfortable uh, with it being a data center for them moving forward. And then uh, I think we have another question about the uh, analytical data-driven site selection to identify smaller capacity sites for business data facilities. Um, to answer your question, yes, we can certainly uh, do that evaluation. And part of what we do when we do these evaluations via that process is we actually have data on the entire locality and you can, you can make decisions, smart decisions about properties uh, down to five, 10 acres. And so it's not just 100 plus acre sites that we're looking at. That's what we've historically looked at for larger data center enterprise users. Um, but we can certainly do it for smaller uh, facilities and we have the capacity to do that via the uh, analytical data driven site selection process. Great, thanks Joe. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, but if there are no more um, that we get submitted, um, we'll go ahead and stay on for just a bit to see if anyone has any other questions. Okay. Well, Courtney, if it, well, Brittany, if there are no more, uh, if there are no more questions, um, uh, this is Joe. I would lo certainly love to uh, thank everybody for their time to uh, join us today. Um, we're obviously very passionate about uh, economic development and success of our clients. And uh, data centers really are driving the energy market right now, as well as they are driving local economies. And we really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very passionate about this and we look forward to working with you um, and power companies to, to help fill um, your localities or your uh, economic development potential for your site searches and whatnot. And again, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Mac or Clay. Uh, we'll be glad to answer them as best we can. And again, thank you for your time and everybody stay safe. Great, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, like he said, uh, if you have any questions after the presentation, please feel free to um, reach out to Joe, Mac, or Clay. Um, and as a final note, uh, Timmons Group is continuing to hold virtual learning courses for PDH, AIA, and APA credit. Um, please visit our website at www.timmons.com under the virtual learning button to register for our upcoming presentations. And with that, that concludes our online program. Thank you to our presenters and all of today's participants. <laughs>